Well, Martin, thanks for joining us uh, today. And I um, want to spend some time talking about an issue uh, that divides many in our country, that is immigration. What is it uh, about uh, immigration that causes so much divide? It's very difficult to answer that question reliably because there's so much inconsistency in people's attitudes. 77% in a poll said that re immigration was too high and needed to be reduced. But when they were asked, are they a problem in your area? Only 2% saw it as a problem in their locality. And then in the general election, UKIP got 12% of the vote. And one of the main arguments that people were giving for voting UKIP was because of immigration, high levels of immigration. But the fact remains that a lot of business organisations want to recruit people from overseas because we've got an ageing population. So recruiting skilled young workers is something that industry and business is, is into. And when you ask people, well, do immigrants work hard? A very high proportion say, yes, they usually work hard. And in London, which has the highest concentration of immigration, uh, then you find more relaxed attitudes. So uh, you can't see a consistent pattern. And I suspect that underlying it all is a fear and, and a desire to preserve our prosperity from people coming in and sharing in it and diluting it. You mentioned briefly that it, it is a political issue and we saw that in the election with UKIP. But give us a sense of how our government now views immigration. Well, they view it as something which they have got to get on top of, partly, of course, to neutralise the influence of UKIP, because that, of course, is on the right of the political spectrum and therefore threatens the Tories. But in 2015 election, they seem to achieve that. Secondly, I think the government feels very much that they have to try to preserve living standards in this country, and they've been under threat because of the austerity policies we've had. And they promised to reduce it from hundreds of thousands to tens of thousands. They failed, of course. They failed largely because of the rules of the United, uh, European Union, which say that there must be free movement of labor across borders. And um, in that sense, they can't stop it. Um, they can't reduce it um, without, in a sense, falling out with their European partners. And that, of course, is why UKIP is advocating we should leave Europe. I want to talk about the word immigrants, because for, for many it's a very negative word. It has certain mm -hmm. connotations. But what do we actually mean when we talk about an immigrant? Well, they're not a homogeneous group. First of all, we've got students who are coming here paying very high fees to study in our universities and colleges. And on the whole, they're not, people are not so hostile to them. Secondly, we've got people who are recruited here by business because they've got skills that are needed and they can no longer find in the British labour market. Thirdly, we've got people coming here to join their families and they tend not to be very popular because it's seen that they are pressure on our services, our social services, housing and uh, education, class sizes of schools, of course, very high, and NHS waiting times. And the, the, the last category, uh, are, well, the last but one, are asylum seekers. They come here because they're escaping persecution, and in many cases they're coming from um, Syria and Iraq where the Christians are being persecuted and they're flowing out of there to try and find um, some security in, in, in the West, and Britain is an obvious target. The other category, of course, are the illegal immigrants, and they're the people that are most opposed by everybody. And there are lots of them, as we all see from the broadcasts from Calais. Is there a sense that when we use the word immigrant, people's attention goes to that final category that you talked about, illegal immigrant, rather than those who are here as, as students, those who are asylum seekers, etc.? Yes, because we see photographs and film on the television every night from Calais, from the refugee camp there. We see people trying to get uh, into Britain on lorries. Um, one even walked down the tunnel and was not found until he was very close to, to, to entering uh, Dover. Um, but we find, yes, there are real fears that in that group will come some who mean violence. Supporters of, of um, ISIL, uh, the jihadists who are coming here, coming home perhaps, having fought for ISIL for a period, coming home with the intention 
of replicating what they've done there in our own country. Where did the negativity towards uh, immigrants come from historically? I mean, because there is this attitude of, you know, they come to our country, they take our jobs. Where, where did that start from? I think it started when we were basically under economic pressure and people wanted jobs with high levels of unemployment, which falling now, of course, but there were, we were, we were sort of very high levels of unemployment in, in the last decade. And the fear, I think, is that these people are coming taking British jobs. The truth is probably mixed, that some of them come without a job and they can't get a job and then they apply for benefits. So there are, are offence against the taxpayer who's got to fund them. Uh, but others are coming because they've been recruited and they are doing a good job. And as I say, most people think that those who do that work hard and are in fact making a valuable contribution to our economy. If we try and bring the idea of religion or faith into this uh, debate at, at this point, uh, I mean, there's, there's, I guess, two sides to this. Uh, on one side, you've got the idea that we don't want just anybody coming into our country where you know they might be uh, inciting terrorism or they might be wanting to uh, get involved in acts of terrorism. But on the other side, we can see uh, how much kind of diversity and value people coming into our country have, have brought to you know the faith system as a whole in the UK, but in our churches as well. I think we need a sense of history here. The first point, I think, is that Britain has a very honourable tradition of being a sanctuary for political leaders, heads of state like Napoleon III, who came here when after the, the revolution ousted him, he came here and settled. And there have been a whole train of, of um, refugees coming from overseas. I remember General Gowan, the former president of Nigeria, came here and is still living here, working. Um, so first of all, we're a sanctuary and that's surely an honourable and legitimate thing to, to, to do. Secondly, there are the other side that are coming here because they want to get a more sustainable lifestyle, a more prosperous lifestyle, and they've seen so much through the media, the social media and, and the, what they see on television and stuff of the prosperity in this country, and they think, well, this is a good place to settle especially if they are English speakers. And of course, English is an issue because it's the lingua franca for the whole world, if I can use that French expression. And the, the, um, the reason they come here um, in, in significant numbers is because they think they can get work and make a living. And it's very difficult to resist that when they're coming from countries where there's persecution or whether there's, there's, there's hardship and abuse and they want to find a, a peaceful life. But there is also that sense in which many of them are doing it illegally. Something like 30,000 a year are trying to enter this country illegally and the authorities are clearly trying very hard to prevent that because then we would have a sense in which it runs amok. I want to move things on, Martin, and, and talk about what the, the Christian perspective is on immigration, what the Bible says, and I guess that's a controversial uh, question in itself. But as you know, the average Christian person walking into church, walking on the streets, what should their stance on the immigration be? Well, I think it's a good question. There are, is quite a lot of teaching in the Bible. I mean, right from the beginning in the Old Testament, although the Israelites are warned not to mix too much with foreigners because the, the fear was that they would turn away from Yahweh, which is exactly, of course, what did happen, but um, there were ex significant examples uh, in the Old Testament of immigrants who made it good. Ruth, the, the um, immigrant that came back with her mother-in-law, Naomi, um, was actually King David's grandmother. And um, then you find Daniel, who's um, in the court of, of Nebuchadnezzar and then in the court of, of um, uh, the Medes, Cyrus and, and Darius and so on. These are examples of people who have made it good elsewhere and um, then came back in, in some cases, not in Daniel's case, but in Nehemiah and so on, to rebuild Israel. When we get to the New Testament, it's much more explicit. Jesus teaching about salt and light, being different like salt and light is from, from the decay um, and the darkness to making a difference 
um, is part of it. And Jesus' own example, the Good Samaritan parable, about a Samaritan who is a foreigner being a model for how we should love our neighbour. And in his own teaching, Jesus illustrated just how he dealt with immigrants, the, the woman, the Canaanite woman who came begging for him to release his daughter, her daughter from a, 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 a spirit, which he did. He argued with her, but she made the case, she had faith, and he, he, he healed her. There was a, a Samaritan leper, the only one of ten who was healed and came back and said thanks. Jesus commended him. What happened to all the Israelites when this foreigner came back to me? Your faith has made you well, he said. So there are examples in the New Testament. Then we go on to Paul. So Paul used, um, and let me quote from it. Um, he said uh, about Gentile converts, in Christ you're no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people. So I think from a biblical perspective, we have to have some sort of serious respect for foreigners that they are made in God's image, just like you and I. How far does that respect go, though? Because uh, on one hand, you know, it's, it's great. We should, you know, love our, our neighbor, etc. But if we were to open the, the doors for anybody to come into our country, surely that's not sustainable for us here in the UK. It may not be anybody, but let's bear in mind, first of all, that there are more immigrants going into Germany there are, than are in our country. We make a big deal of it. The Germans have endured it much more graciously than we have. So first of all, let's model ourselves on the Germans rather than um, on, a, on a selfish attitude. But secondly, we have to recognize we have an aging population and there are needs in, uh, for skilled workers in some sectors of British industry and business and they can't find them in this country in sufficient numbers, so they look overseas. If business is going to recruit overseas, then, then there must be some positive value in, for that, and we need to respect their freedom to do that for the good of the British economy. For the UK church, how can it be responding to the issue of immigration? We think of things like the, the crisis over in Calais. What can the, the church be doing to, to help or uh, to contribute uh, to this issue and others like it? Well, I think we saw a wonderful example with, with Jamie Cuttridge over a week or so ago, going with compassion to care for those people who are living in a terrible mess, um, living very rough and taking um, sleeping bags and blankets and food and clean clothes to help them. Secondly, to recognize that there is a Christian community at Calais, that one of the immigrants or potential immigrants came intending to come into Britain and instead he felt God called him to stay in Calais and be a pastor there. And if you watch the, the television reports from Calais, you will see there is, there is a church there with a cross on the top. So we have to recognize that these are not just nasty foreign people, but many of them, or some at least, we don't know the numbers, are Christians who want to come and join what they think is a Christian country. Whether it is or not is open to debate, but they think that's where they're coming. Just finally then, what are the takeaway action points for us, Martin? Well, I think the takeaway action points are, first of all, that we have to look at these as people made in God's image, not as some sort of foreign rubbish that we don't really want. Let's, let's treat them with respect as human beings. Secondly, we have to try to distinguish between genuine asylum seekers seeking to escape from persecution, seeking to escape from um, extended unlimited national service as in Eritrea, escaping in a sense from hardship and war, um, to come here for peace and sanctuary. We've got a Lord, we've got to draw that distinction. And then I think that we have to say that if our motive is simply to preserve our prosperity and our, our, our way of life, we've got to recognize there are more important things than that. That's a very materialistic, worldly assumption. We've got to recognize that in God's scheme of things, these people matter and they should matter to us too. And lastly, I think we've got to recognize that prevention is better than cure. It always is in public policy. If we can prevent a problem, we can save a lot of taxpayers' money, etc. Now, insofar as we have 0.7% of GDP in overseas aid and development funding, we can focus some of that into those countries where people are fleeing 
that isn't going to solve the problem in Syria and Iraq or in Libya perhaps where the jihadists are a, a major problem but in many parts of Africa they're coming here because they want a viable w way of life and we've got to say well let's try and give give them that in their own country by helping them, finding the right way of doing it so the channels take the money where it's needed and it's not used corruptly, but also in that sense training and educating people to make a difference in their own country rather than letting them flee to this country, they're needed there. You know in, in Ghana they only have four cancer specialists in the whole country, they need 40 and if we take them into our country to fill up the gaps in our service, we're actually leaving people to die in Ghana. So we've got to consider what is in the best long-term interest of those countries and work with them to solve their problem rather than making them our problem. Okay, great to speak to you on this issue, Martin.